Good morning. Uh, my name is Pat Allen, and I help do interviews for the Library of Congress. And we have the privilege today here at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Library uh, to interview an Army veteran from the Second World War, Earl Lawrence Reynolds. Uh, Good morning, Earl. Good morning. And I think people call you Larry? That's correct. All right. Can we call you Larry this morning? That's fine. All right. That's fine. Okay. I'm better known as Larry than I am as Lawrence, <laughs> or, and a lot of people don't even know I'm named Earl. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, uh, our cameraman today uh, is Brian Powers, and he also is the individual uh, for whom the uh, Library of Congress uh, project is done here in, in Cincinnati. So uh, he will be probably asking you some questions uh, throughout our interview. But thank you for coming this morning. Okay. Uh, tell us, first of all, before we get into your military background, let's, let's talk about your own personal background and your family. Uh, where and when were you born, Larry? I was born in Middletown, Ohio, March 29, 1926. Uh, Who were uh, your parents? My parents were Lawrence and Ella Jane Crispin Reynolds, and uh, uh, wonderful parents. I I still miss them, and. Uh, uh, I looked up to my dad because he was my hero from World War One, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about his, him being in World War One here in a little bit. Uh, what, was, was he born in Kentucky? Yes, he was in a little town called McKinney, Kentucky. And you have to have a real good Rand McNally map to find it. It's just a blink your eyes and you missed it. <laughs> and where was your mother from? My mother was from Campton, Kentucky. And uh, she came to Middletown. She was born in 1903. And came to Middletown like 1904 or 1905. She was just a baby when she came to Middletown. So did she and your dad uh, meet here in Middletown? Yes, they did. What, what did your father do for, for a living? Well, my dad worked out at Armco. He started out as a shearman in West Processing and uh, uh, then they z opened the zinc grip line, and he was over cutting samples about uh, four inches in diameter. He'd weigh them with the coating, and then he'd weigh them after he stripped the coating to make sure he had the right amount of zinc on the uh, sample or on the strip going through. So he was uh, kind of quality control, was he? Uh, I, he was working on a metallurgical department. How about your mother? Did your mother uh, work outside the home when they married? No, no. She, she raised three children. I have a brother and a sister. What and are their names? What's your brother's name? My brother's name is Keith Reynolds. He's li he lives in Crossville, Tennessee, and uh, he loves the climate down there, and uh, he's starting to have a little problem right now, health-wise, and uh, uh, we used to go hunting, play golf, and all that good stuff but uh, neither one of us can do it today. <laughs> How old is Keith? He's nine years younger than me, and that makes him 84. He's 84 now? And uh, 
Your, your, uh, your sister? My sister is uh, 10 years younger than me. That makes her 83. All right, and what's her name? Her name's Carol Jean Fulstead. And where does she live? And she lives up in Middletown on Trafalgar Square. Right. Uh, uh, now, how about you? Uh, uh, were you married? I was married in uh, uh, 1949. Uh, I came home from service, started at Miami University. I got my freshman year in, and then I started my sophomore year, and I thought, no, I'm going to quit and get married. So I quit school, much to my dismay. I went out to Armco, got a job, and because I didn't have the sheepskin, uh, I had a job. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, the uh, uh, I was afraid somebody else might grab her <laughs> while I was going to school. Uh, we had a wonderful marriage. And what was her and name? Her name was Margaret Ann Meal, M-E-H-L. And uh, uh, we were, had four children. My son was a heavy smoker and got cancer of the esophagus, and he died at age 48. And I still have three daughters. Well, I'm sorry to hear Cindy, about your son. Cindy Lynn Kuhn, and she lives in Burlington, Kentucky. Uh, Terry Michelle Henry, and she lives there in Middletown, and Tammy Lee uh, Hughes, she lives down on the west side of Hamilton. You've got a good, uh, good recall. When, uh, when was your wife Margaret uh, born? Margaret was born April 6, 1928. And when did you marry Margaret? Uh, October 8th, 1949, we were married. All right, and uh, I've got down, uh, Cynthia was born in uh, 1954. That's correct. Uh, July the 24th of 1954. And then Terry, the next one, was born July 6th of 1957. Correct. And then how about Tammy Lee, when was she? December 7th, 1960. Oh. I should have named her Pearl. <laughs> <laughs> you should have. <laughs> well, uh, did you uh, go to grade school in Middletown? I went to school in Middletown. Jefferson School was right across the street from me. I didn't have to go far there. And then uh, uh, that was elementary school. Then I went up to Roosevelt Junior High School, which was maybe a mile away, and went to Middletown High School and uh, graduated in 1944. I graduated on Friday and uh, Monday, I was down at Fort Thomas Sworn Inn. The, uh, all three schools have been demolished, and they were good schools. And uh, I watched them tear down Jefferson School, and when they hit that big wall with that backhoe, the operator got a ride because it was built like a fort. <laughs> and uh, uh, they built the first part 
And then in 1926, they made a big addition to the school. And uh, uh, like I say, it was built like a, a fortress. And, but the nice thing, all of us kids in the neighborhood just had to go across the street and we had a ball diamond, we had a football field, we had a playground over there, played kick the can in the night and the evenings. Uh, uh, our parents kept a strict eye on us to make sure uh, we didn't get into any mischief and when it uh, uh, reached like nine o'clock, we were called home. And uh, uh, good parents, good neighbors, good neighborhood. Well, good, good. Now we're gonna, after your interview, we're gonna interview another fellow, Don Saylor. Did you meet Don Saylor during school? Uh, I knew Don over. Uh, when did you meet him? I met him over at Jefferson School. He was a year ahead of me, but I knew who he was. And uh, we've been friends ever since. Great, and great. What, uh, you say you, you graduated from high school on Friday and you were down in Fort Thomas on Monday. Did you get drafted or did you enlist? No, I was drafted. I turned 18 in March, but uh, so did several of the other boys in there, not particularly on my birthday, but they were born in uh, uh, February, March, and April, and they were given deferments until school was out. And uh, uh, we picked up our diploma one day and two to, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, the third day, we were down in Fort Thomas or some of the fellows there graduated with me. They went to the Navy. Uh, most of them were Navy or Army. And we're, we filled Fort Thomas there with about three bus loads of, uh, of freshly graduated students. <laughs> where, where did you go from Fort Thomas then? Uh, Fort Thomas, uh, we got our uniform. Uh, and then we got on board an old steam engine and went down to Camp Landing, Florida. Camp Landing, Florida was a infantry replacement training center. And uh, uh, we were being trained with all the instrument, infantrymen's uh, instruments like uh, bazooka, mortar, BAR, machine gun, and uh, military courtesy. And uh, uh, given a 17-week training period. And when we finished that, they had papers drawn up who went where. Some of the boys went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma and joined the 42nd Division. And one of my good friends, Dick Shade, was one of those boys. They made him a company runner and the 42nd was committed to combat on January 1st of 1945 
and five days later he died of wounds. Oh. I hated to hear that. And uh, where, where was he? Was he in Europe? Pardon? Was, was he in Europe? That he was, was yes, he was in Europe, and he lived right down the street from me. Uh, we we used to play ball over there in the schoolyard, and. Uh, well, where did you go after your training? Uh, I had papers to go to Fort Benning, Georgia, and. Uh, so we got on the train and went through several tunnels and had the windows open because it was warm in there. And that smoke and suet and everything came in there. And every time somebody uh, would see a tunnel coming up, all the windows would go down till we got through the tunnel. It was... Uh, uh, and then we would pull over and let these milk run trains go by and then we take off and go on a little further south and pulled into Camp Landing uh, and uh, we were assigned a, a barracks and a bunk and uh, a rifle. And we had to learn to take care of that rifle. And uh, uh, how long were you there? We were there 16 weeks, and then uh, uh, I had papers to go to Fort Benning. So I got, and I had 14 days to get from. Camp Landing over to Fort Benning, so I came home for like a week, 10 days, and it was north and then south again. And a lot of people got to see the, the U.S. of A. when they were in service. I saw up and down the East Coast and then overseas. And, uh, Fort Benning, the sergeant met me at the personnel office and uh, he said, pick up your baggage there and follow me. And we were walking down a company street and I said, uh, is this a heavy weapons company, rifle company, what is it? He looked at me and he said, you're in the medics now. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. Uh, in the medics? How'd you get me here? <laughs> but uh, it was good training. And uh, sometimes I wish I'd stayed in the medical field. Uh, makes you feel good when you patch up somebody that's been hurt and uh, you get a self-satisfaction in, in doing a job. Where did you go from there? Uh, there, we, uh, uh, we trained there in Fort Benning till uh, we, if, the 71st was, uh, at that time, a two-regiment division and not motorized. They were going to take mules and go to Italy. Well, uh, Italy surrendered, so then they started. They took some of the cadrymen from the 5th Regiment and the 14th and made uh, the 66th Regiment. And uh, uh, when they got that regiment built up to strength, and all of the regiments, as far as that goes, built up to strength, 
then we boarded a pl uh, railroad car and went around the Atlantic coastline up the uh, east coast to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. And uh, we were there for two days and then they pulled a ship in and we boarded the ship and went overseas in a huge convoy. What was the name of the ship you were on, do you remember? I was on the General T.H. Bliss. It was the flagship of the convoy. We had the division officers, the division band, and uh, it was not too bad. We'd do a call, get us up on the deck there, sections of the ship at different times and do a exercises. Then we'd go below decks and they'd bring another group up and what? Well, at that time, what, what were you in? What was your division and battalion? I was with the 5th Infantry, Infantry Regiment, 1st Battalion Medics. And uh, we, we were going over in a big convoy, zigzagging because German submarines were still around and uh, took us 14 days to get across the Atlantic and uh, during that uh, during that trip across the Atlantic did you have any uh, general quarters because of uh, submarines in the area no we had some uh, Corvettes and destroyers out in front of us and they kept patrolling up and down and uh, uh, they kept the subs away. We Where did you land in, uh, did you go to land in England? We landed in uh, Isle of Wight and uh, picked up an English captain who took us across the English Channel and being the flagship we pulled up to what was left of a harbor there in La Havre, France and uh, uh, the other ships unloaded on those ropes <laughs> and uh, uh, that didn't look like fun but uh, uh, we unloaded, had got on trucks, and went to a tent city by a little town called St. Laurent. And uh, I kept wanting to tell my dad, we're near our, your town, Lawrence, because Laurent is French for Lawrence. <laughs> but I didn't know how to get that passed the censor, <laughs> and uh, uh, I found out later that one of my good friends, Bill Wilch, had landed on D-Day and was laying next to a, uh, one of the Navy uh, 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 he was spotting for the ships out in the harbor and Bill told him, said, there's some Germans up in that church steeple and said, uh, can you take that steeple out? This uh, Navy boy looked at his map, got the coordinates and he called back to the ship and he said, fire one round. And Bill said, you couldn't, a surgeon couldn't take a knife 
and take that top off the way he did. Uh, brick, wood, glass and air blew all over the place, but they didn't call any more artillery down on him. And uh, he said he turned to the Navy boy and he says, now that's what I call good shooting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 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 I was up at Dayton Air Force Base, Wright Pat Field, and uh, I was talking to a gal up there. She had a chest full of ribbons, and uh, she said she'd been over on the uh, beaches of there at Normandy. And I said, do you see a little town called St. Laurent? And she said, I sure did. She said, you know, during the war, they had blown that steeple off and they had rebuilt it now that the war was over. Absolutely beautiful. I told Bill, I said, you know, you and I, should go over and see it, but I don't know how we're going to do it. <laughs> well, did you tell that gal about Bill? Uh, did you yeah, tell her about Yeah, uh -huh. I told her how about how that steeple got knocked down in the first place. <laughs> yeah. So when you got there at St. Laurent, what, what was going on with you and the, and the well, battalion? Well, we, we had some more training there the infantry walked an awful lot, so we went on hikes around through the countryside, keeping in good physical shape. And uh, uh, the rifle company was out doing some uh, uh, more training. And uh, uh, then uh, we were there about two weeks and uh, uh, General Eisenhower's son was a lieutenant in our outfit in the 5th Regiment and uh, uh, he was pulled and sent back to England and uh, his dad didn't want him to get hurt, I guess. So, and he was quite angry because he'd trained with these troops and then here they pulled him and get to lead him into combat. And, uh, uh. Well, what did, what did you do uh, during those two weeks you were there? Is all you did was train? Well, we, we ran sick call all the time. Uh, uh, our door was open 24 hours. And uh, uh, we kept uh, the shots up to date. Uh, uh, I think that's one reason that we went through there with uh, so few colds and uh, uh, other diseases like that. Uh, Were there civilians in uh, St. Laurent with you? Pardon? Were there civilians in town? Uh, a few. There were a few civilians, but not, but there weren't many people in there. Uh, uh, we didn't have anything in that tent to heat it, and uh, I asked this one fellow who was a linguist, how do you say, do you have a candle? And he told me, avez-vous chandelle? So I kept repeating that, repeating that, 
And that evening, uh, my buddies and I, three of them, <laughs> three of my buddies and I walked into this little town of St. Laurent and uh, I kept repeating Ave vous chandel. We came up to the little store and they said, Quinn, ask them, you know how to ask if they have a candle. So they stood in the doorway and sent me in and there was some three or four women, French women sitting in there, all bare shells. And uh, I said, avez-vous chandel? And all I could hear was gibberish. I didn't understand what they were saying. I think they were saying, don't you know there's a war on? <laughs> They didn't have a thing on the shelves to sell. And uh, so we didn't have a candle to light up the tent in the evening. Of course, we couldn't. Uh, they didn't want any lights on that. Anyway, might draw some enemy, enemy fire. Well, about how far were you from the front at that time in the St. Uh, Laurent? We, we were. We were quite a ways from the front. I don't know how far in distance it was, but we were there for the, oh, maybe two weeks. And uh, the, uh, we loaded up. Part of the guys went on 40 and eights. I had a cheap driver's license then, so they put Pop Stembridge and me in the Jeep to drive to wherever, and the rest of the guys went in 48 box cars. And uh, uh, we started out one. Uh, one morning and went down along alongside Paris, which was interesting. And uh, uh, the French girls were out there giving you kisses and the French men and women were Viva la America, Viva la France, and shaking hands with you as you went along. He didn't have much time because we were driving. And uh, uh, when the sun went down, it was cold and there's no heater in the Jeep. And whoever was the passenger would, took a blanket and covered up and tried to get some sleep because we kept switching drivers all the time. And uh, we pulled into this little French town and uh, early in the morning and this Frenchman walks out on a stoop in front of his house, looks around, unbuttons his pants and relieves himself. Oh, wait a minute, what kind of country are we in? But to come to find out, they build a house and they build a barn right next to it or a place to keep their cow and when they clean the cow shed out, they throw it into a big pile right in front of the house. And there's a pump done in that stuff. And it goes down to a sump. And 
they pumped that out into a long wooden wagon and uh, hook the oxen up to it. And they go out and open a, uh, it's about, about three feet long. And uh, it lets that liquid run out and they go back and forth across those fields fertilizing them. Well, if you get downwind from that, it'll bring tears to your eyes. <laughs> oh, that's strong. <laughs> but uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we gathered up there in this little town. It was called B-I-T-C-H-E. We called it bitch. But I think the French referred to it as Bachet. We were in the Alsace-Lorraine sector and they didn't speak German and they didn't speak French. They spoke their own tongue. And uh, 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 this linguist we had with us, he'd listen to them talk, and then he had to d sort it out in his mind what they said. And the Germans are only across the hill. Uh, so that's where we got our baptism of fire. And uh, we relieved the 100th Division, uh, Century Division, and... Uh, uh, Near that little town? in that little town, uh, just on the out, just going well, toward Germany. And the, uh, 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 like I say, we relieved the 100th Division. They had foxholes dug, so we just, which places with them they came back and, and uh, uh, the after World War One, the French built the Maginot Line with their guns fixed pointing toward Germany. So Germans built the Siegfried Line with their guns pointing toward France. And uh, uh, we were down there to draw fire and uh, uh, try to keep all those Germans in those uh, pillboxes busy. And uh, we did the same thing. Hitler came around through the Netherlands where there wasn't any Maginot line. He came into France and France fell in what, a week. Well, the division on our right circled down and came around the lower end of the Maginot line, or Siegfried line, and uh, where the Germans hadn't put any fortifications up. And they worked around back, and we were sitting over here drawing fire, and these fellas came around, came up, and one by one, they started knocking out those pillboxes. It was the old uh, Texas Division. They had a, 
shoulder patch with a arrowhead in it and uh, they would come up and they had vents and they'd come up and take the vent off drop some grenades down there they got a small dozer a welder I don't know where they got all this equipment but they brought it in there and uh, they welded that air vent shut then they took that dozer well, they first they found the door, and uh, the welded it shut, <laughs> and then took the dozer and shoved the, the shoved the dirt over the door, which was uh, used for camouflage. Uh, camouflage, uh, camouflage. That's right, and. Uh, uh, it was slow, but they only had to do the first few, and the Germans realized, hey, they're in back of us. We got to get out of here. So they had to go up and get out or die right there in that Siegfried line. And uh, after a week or 10 days, it was all quiet on the Western Front because that Siegfried line had been evacuated. Well, and while you were while you were drawing fire, did any any of your fellows uh, take any casualties? Oh yeah, yeah, we had some casualties. And we had some wounded. We were out picking up wounded. Well, what, what did you personally do uh, during that period of time? Were you uh, picking up wounded or treating I, fellas? At that time, I was a litter bearer. And uh, if a company commander called our aid station uh, and our call name was Whiskey Red 1-6. We've got two casualties. We got three casualties. Uh, Captain Dunn would say, okay, uh, two men to a litter. And, or it was better if you had four men uh, a lot easier for four men to carry one of those. And we go to the company, pick up the wounded man, patch him up if he needed it, and then bring him back to the aid station. Captain would look at him, and then we put him on an ambulance, or put them on an ambulance and send them back to a hospital. So, and, uh, so did you yourself uh, uh, give any aid to any of the wounded before they were uh, stretchered back to the uh, aid station? Did we why? Did you yourself give any initial oh, treatment yeah. to the wounded? Yes, yes. What, kind of, what kind of wounds you did you did? What kind of wounds did you treat? Come up and say, where you hit? Well, I'm hit right here in the thigh. I'm hitting the shoulder. And you patch them up, put a compress on there, stop the bleeding, and get them back out of there as quickly as you could. You, you didn't want to stay there too long. <laughs> right. And because you might be the, ca the next casualty. Yeah. And uh, uh, I started out as a litter bearer, and then uh, uh, I graduated to the 
being a medic with a rifle company. And the medic was right with the rifleman right there on the front. And uh, we, we treated the injured first uh -huh. before the litter bearers ever got there. And uh, uh, so where were you? In, were you in France when you uh, went with the infantry as the medic? No, I was in Germany then. Where in Germany? Uh, uh, after we got that Maginot line, or Siegfried line cleared, we were down with the 5th Army, and uh, we walked north two days, crossed the Rhine River, and went into Germany. And there, when we crossed the Rhine River, we walked across a pontoon boat, a uh, pontoon bridge, excuse me, and uh, we're walking along there, two abreast, and I said to my buddy, I said, Hoy, look over there in the corner, by those bushes, and he looked and he says, it's patent. And I said, yeah, better straighten up and be, be a soldier now. And uh, uh, he watched us come from the 5th Army up to the 3rd. He was a spit and polish general, and we had been down there in France, and the uh, boys had picked up top hats, white silk scarves, bicycles, that be walking, and uh, the next day we got a letter, get rid of all non-GI equipment that you're carrying. And uh, you're a soldier, look like one. And uh, I don't know where Pat got his paper or had it printed, but he sure got the job done. And, now, did, uh, did you have a chance to meet him or you just, you just saw him or did you actually meet him? No, I, I just saw him. We came, we saw him when we crossed the Rhine. When the war ended, we had to pass in review for him down by Munich. And uh, uh, seems to me there was one other place that I saw him. I don't remember where that may have been. But, uh, 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 kind of, kind of hated the man because it was go, go, go. And uh, when I came home and read some of the books and so on, uh, I realized he was right. You knock your enemy down and keep him down. He can't fight. And uh, that's, that was his pattern. Hit him and knock him down and keep him down. And uh, uh, that old boy was right and I learned to like him. <laughs> well, let's, uh, what rank were you when you entered the service? What was your rank? Well, I was a private when I first went in. Okay. Did and you then, get promotions? As soon as we went overseas, the major said, everybody's going to be a PFC. Uh, give you a raise some way. So he made us all PFCs. 
and I was a PFC till uh, long after the hostility ceased. Then uh, 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 I was made corporal, and then I was made a T4 technician fourth class, and uh, put in charge of a regimental aid station. And where was that? That was in. Uh, uh, I was in, uh, about 60 miles north of Munich. So it was in Germany? It was in Germany, yes. Some of the older hands went home and they had to fill the job, so they took some of us new guys and moved us up. So, uh, uh, were, were you in Germany when it was announced that the war was over? Uh, we were down in Austria when the uh, uh, war w ended. We were down there in a little, it was a little one-horse town, Glink, G-L-E-G-L-I-E-N-K. -E -E I doubt if you can even find it on a map of any sort. What were your duties down in uh, Austria? Uh, well, when the uh, uh, hostilities ceased, uh, we went back to running sick call every morning, and then we had a uh, charge of quarters. He'd be there all, all that day. Uh, or the rest of the day, and then anyone come in uh, with any kind of an injury, well, he'd take care of him unless uh, uh, the captain was right there. Well, what took you from Germany to Austria? Why did you go from Germany down to Austria? We walked. <laughs> we. We walked a lot of miles. Well, why did you go there? Uh, uh, it was like um, the war ended May 8th. It was like May 1st that we hit the Austrian border and went down there in that little town and uh, we had been living, we'd tell people, move out of your house, we're taking over. But after that, we couldn't do it anymore. So they moved us up on the mountainside, pitched tents, and there we were, up on the mountainside down in, uh, this little town, and uh, there was a uh, uh, like a Catholic uh, monastery or something down there, and uh, so. Each day we had a certain time, but that was only the, for the GIs. We'd go down there and get a shower, and uh, uh, this one, one fellow and I got caught down there. We went down there a little late, and uh, by the time we finished, the civilians were starting to move back in, uh, and uh, uh, we hurried up. I mean, we hurried up, got dressed, and got out of there before uh, we we were really embarrassed. But uh, uh, come out of the side, cross the road, 
and go up on the mountainside. And uh, we had a little plateau up there, put up a volleyball mat, and uh, uh, there, there were some nice streams down there. And uh, if you found some uh, fishing equipment in one of the houses, you borrow that and go, go fishing. But we were down there fishing one day and sitting there under a tree and with a bait out there in the water. I looked around and here were all these Raybuck. They were small German deer, just about 60 pounds. And uh, we decided, okay, let's start hunting now. <laughs> <laughs> so we put the fishing poles away, got rifles from the infantrymen, and uh, uh, we didn't have too much luck there. But then uh, we weren't there. We may have been there uh, uh, three, three weeks. And they moved us back into Germany. And uh, I forget all the names of those times. We were in a little town called Wertenschen. And uh, our major, uh, our major wanted to go around and inspect all the medical uh, facilities there. And I had a Jeep driver's license, so I got to drive the Jeep major. And that was the day we had a USO show right there. And I'm driving down the road and I could see him in this big field over there. And, uh, uh, but that's fine. I probably wouldn't have gone anyway. But uh, we went to uh, each of the regiments and each of the uh, uh, battalion uh, aid stations and the major got out, looked around, and he was a hard-nosed major. Now you will clean this up and you will do this and you will do that. I'll be back next week. It better be clean. And uh, uh, so uh, I didn't drive him the next time. I don't know who took him, but uh, I was I was in Rosenheim, Germany, when I was made a T four. Okay. Well, how was that little town in Austria? Had that been? Uh, spared from the bombings and shelling, or was that pretty well destroyed? No, it, those country, little country towns like that, no industry, nothing there in the way of a target for the bomber. No, those guys made out very good. They had their cow, they had chickens, they had their gardens, they ate pretty well. And uh, uh, nearly all of them made wine. So we'd just go out there and talk to some of these farmers. Uh, and uh, uh, we'd trade our cigarettes for wine. Mm -hmm. And uh, they lived 
they'd live the good life. But in towns like Munich, Nuremberg, Augsburg, they were hit pretty good. And uh, Munich, you'd see a big tall building, nothing on the inside. The inside had been burned out, but uh, just the outside shell standing there. And uh, uh, Did you treat any uh, German prisoners uh, as a medic? Oh, yeah. Uh, I would treat the Americans first, and then uh, I'd treat the prisoners. But uh, I never treated a German before treating an American. And uh, uh, there, where, where we ended up in Austria, headquarters was in Steyr, Austria, which was a big town. And uh, Captain Wyman, General Wyman, our company, our division commander, knew that there were some American or German soldiers across the river, and uh, the Russians were not too far away from them. So he sent three fellows out to go find the commandant and see if he wanted to surrender to the Americans or to the Russians. And one of them, one of the three fellows that went out was a medic, <laughs> went with them, but he was scared to death all the time. They were driving down this road, and here's all these German soldiers with their rifles over their shoulders, and uh, they went, I don't know how many miles. Uh, finally, one of the Germans stepped out and stopped a jeep. Where are you going? We want to see your commandant. Well, okay, come over here. And I had took him over and parked him. And there was a beautiful big home there, a big farmhouse. And uh, they took him out, these three fellows in there. One of the three fellows spoke fluent German, but he didn't let them know about that. And uh, so they took them in, and uh, they said they wanted to know if he wanted to surrender to the Americans or the Russians. And uh, he gave him some reply, and uh, he thought a minute, and he said, take him out and shoot him. Well, at that time, the one that spoke German spoke up and said, sir, you know, these men have been good men. They fought for you. I've been fighting real hard against the Russians. They said, now, if you f surrender to the Russians, you know that not many of them are going to see their home again. And, uh, if they capture you, 
you know what they're going to do to you as a general. And uh, he thought a minute and he turned to the operator, telephone operator, and he said, uh, how far are the Russians up the road? And uh, uh, they said, they're only three days away. And he turned around and he said, uh, I won't surrender to a, a, a field general. I'll surrender to Patton or one of your other generals. And uh, he said, it's getting late now. You fellows just stay all night and tomorrow you can see to get back. And uh, so they, they fed them real well. And uh, when he got up the next morning and so on, and uh, uh, he said, you tell them that uh, Major General or whatever, uh, I'm commander of the whatever army, German army, not a division. And uh, so they went back and told Wyman, and they got some other general come out, and he took their surrender. And you talk about having prisoners. We had a whole army of prisoners. And uh, in that little town that we were in, we had nine prisoner camps in there. Well, nine. And uh, uh, it was strange. There was the Inns River, I-N-N-S. And uh, we had guards outside those prison camps. And when the sun came up in the morning, there'd be three, four, five Germans outside waiting to get put into that camp. <laughs> <laughs> they got across that river before the Russians could get to them. And uh, there, they, uh, they told some of the American guards, said, we want to take a shower, we're dirty. And uh, so they told the captain, and the captain said, well, give them a towel and a washcloth and a bar or so, and send them down to the river. They went down to the Enns River one time the Russians were sitting on the hill across the river, and they're sitting up there shooting at them. Oh, really? And they decided that wasn't a good thing. So they found other ways to get them bathed, and uh, uh, I don't know what that was. I was up on that hillside, <laughs> and uh, uh, I don't know what went on down there. Well, how did you find out that uh, Germany had surrendered? That how, the war was over in Germany? Uh, we had, uh, uh, we had a fellow come in from headquarters, and headquarters had a radio, and they drove in and said, the war's over, war's over. 
And uh, uh, we had picked up a radio and we got a, what we do with our radio? We took it down to that house, that farmhouse, and uh, uh, turned it on, and we got the news there. Well, how'd you feel when you heard that? Boy, we were real happy because uh, we had lost quite a few men in our trail across Germany there and down into Austria and uh, they were building up to full strength. Then we were going through the Brenner Pass and go down uh, into Italy, board a ship and go around for the uh, back door entrance into Japan we didn't want any part of that. So you knew that the Japanese hadn't surrendered yet and you were expecting to go to We Japan? thought we were going to be on the way for Japanese invasion. And... Uh, How did you hear about the atomic bombs? Uh, uh, I think... Uh, I think the only way we heard about that was through Stars and Stripes. They printed those papers out and uh, uh, that was that was one of the highlights when they dropped the second one and Japan surrendered. We were just as happy as could be because we knew we aren't going over there. Uh, Did you know your buddy Don Sailor was in the Navy then? I knew he was in the Navy, but I didn't know where or what ship he was on or anything like that. Well, when, when, were, you, uh, when were you released from the, uh, from the Army? Uh, June 6th of 46. And where did you go from, when you were released, where were you? Uh, Camp Atterbury, Indiana. When did you come back to the States? Uh, we left over there about the middle of May and uh, went to this town and they started telling us about what was going on back in the States. Uh, clothes, uh, keep your GI insurance. Uh, first thing they wanted you to do, clean up your language. <laughs> well, uh, fortunately, I was in a group that uh, we had respect for Captain Dunn and Donna Freya and they didn't like swearing. So we didn't have too much to clean up. What was Captain Dunn's first name? Ed. And how about Donna Freya? Serafina Anthony Donna Freya. <laughs> Tell us uh, what kind of uh, badges or commendations did you get uh, as a result of your uh, military service? I got the Combat Maddox badge, uh, ETO ribbon with uh, two campaign stars, uh, the Victory ribbon, uh, Army of Occupation, uh, a bronze star and the uh, good conduct medal. How did you earn the bronze star? For just just for being there. 
uh, Congress decided uh, anybody that had the combat medics badge or combat infantryman's badge, anyone who's in combat deserved more of a honor. It is a bronze star without a V on it, V for valor. It's just a plain bronze star. And that was shipped to me uh, a long time after any hostility over there. I was trying to think of when when they shipped those out. Uh, I was living over there in the house there on Allen Drive and I got this little package and I opened it and There's your bronze star. There's a bronze star and a letter from a uh, uh, Washington telling us that the uh, congressman decided we needed something more. <laughs> well, did Can you, you imagine they spent all that time deciding that when they should have been working on this country? <laughs> <laughs> did you yourself have any close calls uh, uh, when, you, when you were near the front? Well, or behind the, behind oh, the front? Oh, yeah. Uh, the day we crossed the uh, Danube River, uh, the medics had walked right up through the uh, uh, infantryman. The infantryman took a break and sitting alongside the road, and we walked right on past them. And there. Uh, uh, with, uh, there's 30 some men in a battalion aid station and part of the men were out with the companies and uh, we had maybe, maybe 20 of us and we walked right through those guys early in the morning and uh, uh, walked up and there was four, three or four or five officers standing there and this one said, who's got their men ready? Captain Dunn says, my men are ready, get them across. He didn't ask if we were riflemen or what, you know. Here we were, a bunch of medics with band-aids and aspirin <laughs> to throw at the enemy. So we walked down, got in uh, uh, these little boats. We were supposed to go from here right over there. And there was a bombed out bridge right over there. But that Danube was up, it was muddy, it was swift, and we started out, and we ended up way down here. And uh, they didn't have much of a kicker on that engineer boat. So we unloaded, and he went back over to get some riflemen. And uh, I said, okay, we're supposed to be at the bridge. Let's walk up there. So we started walking. There was just a little bit of land that was still dry. And we're trying to stay on that instead of getting wet. And uh, we walked down through there. And, and we didn't know, but that field that we were walking by was full of Germans. And uh, 
we walked up through there and uh, uh, there was a place that was scooped out along the bank and uh, from the high water and uh, we heard this machine gun and we all dove in along there and uh, we laid there at least two hours eating mud that the machine gun had cut loose and he was trimming the grass off right above our head and you'd see those shells hitting in the water right in back of us. And uh, 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 <laughs> it was a, that was a close time. What, how, were you <clears throat> how were you relieved from that? Uh, did somebody knock out the machine gun? Somebody. <clears throat> uh, uh, Company L landed down further downstream and they went across and they came up and they were clearing out the fields uh, and uh, that field that we'd walk by so early in the morning here was all these crowds coming out of there you know with their hands up what in the world? If they'd have known, they could have wiped us out there in just a uh, matter of seconds. And uh, uh, that was one real close time. And uh, uh, there were a couple other scary times. I was out with a rifle company and there was a 20 millimeter gun on a hillside that had just stopped everybody. And uh, uh, the sergeant said, uh, don't get around that wire. And uh, he had a good friend that was a sergeant and uh, he was over by that wire and that's 20 millimeter gun cut loose in there and that wire just cut him to ribbons. Ooh. And uh, uh, so uh, I stayed back from that, but I thought, Doggone, why doesn't he send three or four men up this draw here and get up there behind that gun and knock it out? And uh, I don't know what he did. Maybe he did. But anyway, finally the gun quit firing. And uh, we were able to keep moving down the road then. And uh, we, we were walking down the road one day and uh, the day before our rations came in and we got a couple bags of beech nut tobacco, chewing tobacco. And uh, Captain threw her names in a hat, shook them up. I want a bag of chewing tobacco. Uh, well, I'll try it. So I put a wad in there. And I had me a nice cud walk to but I couldn't spit. Uh, and these baseball players that, uh, I can't do that. So anyway, we're walking down 
both sides of the road, and here comes an airplane, German airplane, and he comes down through there strafing us. And I took a dive into a ditch, and go. Oh. <laughs> I swallowed that cud of tobacco, and uh, uh, I got back up on the road after the plane was gone, and uh, my stomach didn't turn inside out, but it it was churning, and uh, I said, hey, Cleo, you chew tobacco, don't you? And he says, yeah. I said, here, have a chew. <laughs> I said, that's yours, I can't chew it. And uh, uh, he was so thankful to get that tobacco because he loved chewing tobacco. Well, that, did that German plane, when he was strafing, did he uh, kill or, or injure anybody? He made that one pass, and he's gone. Good. And uh, <clears throat> uh, they were real low on fuel. And uh, we were we were strafed one day. We'd been coming down the road, and they decided, hey, here's a good place to take a break. And we had been on, riding on a half track that day. And uh, a tra half track had a big 50 caliber on it. And uh, we were going to go in this house and heat up our sea rations. And uh, all of a sudden, we could hear him rat tat 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 way off, and he was coming up zigzagging and hitting, uh, and then he started across with this operator of the half track ran out. I've never seen a guy do that before. He jumped and up, and he was sitting in there, firing way out in front of the German plane, and you could see the tracers, and he just let that guy fly right up, and he just came, he just came down with the muzzle a little bit, and boom, boom, there was about three big puffs of black smoke, and he peeled over and gone. Mm. And uh, uh, I went in and heated my rations then, but they made short, fast passes uh, right there at the end because they didn't have any fuel. In fact, out along that German Autobahn, we saw brand spanking new airplanes pushed back and hidden in the woods. No gas, no fuel. And uh, it'd be nice to take one of those home for museum, <laughs> wouldn't it? Did you ever talk to Don about uh, how he was eating while he was aboard ship as compared to your sea rations? Oh, I was kidding him out there. He was between white sheets and uh, having ice cream and steak. And he should have been out there thus eating mud. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Larry. I'm sure that Brian has some questions. Yeah, I was, uh, I was wondering, I think you said that your dad was in World War One. Yes. What part of, uh, where was he in World War I? And were you, did you happen to go anywhere when you were over there in your that he was in World War I, I, co I covered some of the same ground that my dad covered in uh, 1918. 
uh, he he had been orphaned and uh, him and four other buddies were up here in Cincinnati. He had an aunt, Nan, that uh, uh, we used to come and visit. And uh, uh, him and these boys were walking down uh, and Pancho Villa had just come over into Texas and burned the town, killed like 12 people. And they had all these I want you posters around. And Dad said, let's go in and enlist. And these guys said, well, why not? All except one, he backed out. And the other three couldn't pass a physical. My dad passed a physical and away he went. He lied about his age also. He was supposed to be 21, he wasn't 21. And, uh, but uh, he went down to uh, Texas and was with down there chasing Poncho all around Mexico. They never did catch him. Uh, uh, Eisenhower, Patton, MacArthur were three of the guys that had just got out of West Point and were down there uh, fighting or trying to find Poncho in the meantime. And, uh, but anyway, Dad, uh, by the time his first three year in enlistment was up, we were at war with Germany and uh, he was on the first boatload of GIs to go over to France. He landed St. Nazaire and uh, went to a little town called uh, what was it, Monte Court and they built obstacle courses so the guys coming over to have something to train and work on. And uh, then uh, 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 Marshall, Marshall Foch uh, said, I need troops, I need troops badly. And uh, uh, Black Jack Pershing. No, what was the German or the American Black Jack? Black Pershing. Jack Pershing was over there. Pershing. Uh, <coughs> he said, "Well, now." commit my man. The only thing is now, I'm not going to split them up. A regiment here and a regiment there. They train together. They're going to fight together. And they thought the Americans couldn't fight. Well, the first thing I did was throw them into the Argonne. Uh, that was a their first encounter and uh, uh, they pushed the Germans back and uh, the French had to take a second look. Hey, those guys know how to fight. And uh, 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 Cantigny, St. Mahil, Verdun, uh, 
Canada. Well, I forget the name. There was five major battles, and my dad was in every one of them. And uh, uh, he was the most decorated man from World War I in Middletown. And he was not a Middletown soldier. He was not a, an Ohio soldier. He was born in a little town of McKinney, Kentucky. So when they said, well, we got this Ohio bonus, he went to apply and they said, well, you came from Kentucky, you can't get the Ohio bonus. And he said, okay. So he went to Kentucky when they came out with a bonus. I said, well, you're living in Ohio. You're not a Kentuckian anymore. We can't give you a bonus. <laughs> so he never did get a bonus there. But uh, 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 he was my hero. And, uh, we used to go hunting. And uh, you had to be fast on the trigger, or you'd never have rabbit jump. Uh, he'd make the second jump, and he was in the pouch on my ground, in my dad's hunting coat. <laughs> well, did he, uh, did you guys talk about when you went over there? Did you guys have discussions about, compare notes of your experiences? Pardon? Did you and your dad compare notes of your your experiences? No, no. Uh, uh, not, not that I remember. I don't remember us ever talking about what you did versus what I did or anything like that. Uh, well, I just got one last question. Uh, so what did you do after you got out of the military? What did you end up doing uh, for a career and that kind of thing? Well, I, when I got my discharge paper, uh, uh, well, I'm going to go to college and I went to Miami University. I got my freshman year in, and uh, I met this sweet young thing, and uh, I was over at Miami, and she was in Middletown, and I thought, well, I'm just going to quit school. I'm go to Armco, get a job, and get married, which I did, much to my dismay. If I had stayed in college and got a sheepskin, uh, I would have made a lot more money than what I did. And, uh, but I can't complain, we had we had a wonderful married life and raised four children and uh, uh, had a real good life till Alzheimer's cut her down. But uh, uh, I do, I do wish I had stayed with college and got my paper that said I was smart, so. Uh. Well, that's my last question. Thank you very much. When, when did Margaret pass away? <clears throat> uh, 2006. All right, and my last question is, uh, 
you said your dad was the most decorated uh, veteran from, from Middletown. What medals did he receive? He had a silver star with an oak leaf cluster, purple heart, uh, the Croix de Guerre, uh, and then they they gave him uh, uh, like a band that had all the battles you were in. Uh, uh, and then they gave individual like Verdun and Cantigny and the Argonne. Uh, 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 but they, the Silver Star with the Oak Leaf Cluster, which means two silver stars. Uh, that put him way up above anybody else there in town. Well, I lied to you. I have another question. Uh, you, you and Don both have hats, caps, with uh, ribbons across there. What, what do those ribbons mean? I'm going to ask uh, him about those too. These, uh, this one is... Well, show the camera. This one is the ETO ribbon, and uh, uh, this is a victory medal. I don't know what this one or this one is. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, I would imagine it should, that was uh, one of the Pacific uh, one of those would be the Pacific in Europe and uh, uh, Victory Medal. Well, we've been here a long time. Thank you very much for your interview. Thank you for your service, and you that's been a great interview. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.